Chapter 2, Themes in Biology Long time ago, about 150 years ago to be exact, Charles Darwin once said, Ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. It is those who know little, not those who know much, who should positively assert that this or that problem will never be solved by science. I can tell you what, in the last 150 years, science has answered a lot of our questions about how the universe works. Science works. Chapter 2, Section 1. This is about what does life do? So in this section, what we're going to do is figure out what is the process of life? How can we recognize life if we were to find it elsewhere? To go back, all fields of science have paradigms to provide a framework for understanding past and future findings and put them all in the same context. So for example, evolution by natural selection, that is the central paradigm of biology. It basically means a species change over time. They're adapting to their environment through natural selection. That means that basically all modern species are descendants of ancestral species. That one theory explains the unity and diversity of life. It explains why a ghost crab and a snowy plover in the middle and a lizard all share so many characteristics in common even though, to us, they may look very, very different. The goal of this lesson is to come up with a process of life or some way of thinking about life that we could apply across the board to every living organism on this planet. I'm talking from these green zoanthids on the left to the hammerhead shark in the middle to that passion flower on the right. What do all of these things have in common? And, of course, the other thing is can we take our same view of life and apply it to alien life? This, of course, is a scene from Moss Eisley Space Cantina in the movie Star Wars. One of the most iconic scenes in movie history. A young Luke Skywalker walks into this bar and he sees alien life all over the place. Now, we may or may not discover alien life in our lifetime. It is unlikely that we will discover alien life much like we see in Star Wars here, but we might. And the question is, can we come up with a, a view of life, some way of describing life that we can apply to every living organism on this planet and to alien life that we have yet to discover? So, alien life, would you be able to recognize it if we saw it? And uh, Moss Eisley, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. You better be cautious if you go there. Okay, so I always ask this question in class, would we be able to recognize alien life? Most people usually choose between A and E. Let's see if your answer is going to change throughout the course of this lecture here. To start thinking about life and coming up with a broad view of life, let's dump the characteristics of life. Let's forget about the five characteristics of life or the seven characteristics of life. Let's think about the process of life. So by thinking about the process of life, we can ask the question, what does life do? And can we apply those processes to every single living organism on this planet and to other life that we haven't found yet outside of the planet? So, just starting off, what do these organisms have in common? What do they all have to do? You know, almost every one of us comes up with, well, they have to reproduce first. Well, partly, I've never reproduced. Does that mean I'm not alive? Well, I like to think that I'm alive even though I don't have any kids. Here's the most important thing. Life creates order. Life takes in energy from its environment and it uses that energy to create order. This is a sea anemone from the California coast. It has radial symmetry. Those cells have lots and lots of order, lots of complex molecules in them, lots of DNA storing information. The water around it is completely disordered. The water is high entropy. The living organism is low entropy. So life uses energy to create order. So we can say that life is an island of low entropy. So there you go. Living organisms are islands of low entropy. 
To create order, life has to use energy. Now here's Eric Cartman. He's eating, of course, the chicken skins off of his fried chicken because the chicken skins taste good because you got all that salt and fat in there that makes them taste really good. But one of the ways that life uses energy is it's not just random. You just can't go microwave a jar of peanut butter and hope to get something living out of it. Even though the peanut butter has every ingredient you need for a living organism, you just can't simply add energy. What you really need is some way to utilize that energy to create order. And what I've got on the top right there is cellular respiration. That represents cellular metabolism. We have chemical reactions that break things down. We have chemical reactions that build things up. So all these chemical reactions are utilizing energy to create order. Living organisms are open systems. That means energy flows through you. You take in energy from the foods you eat, and then that energy exits your body mostly as heat. So in many ways, we're like the force, where the force flows through you. If Yoda was talking about energy, he'd be right. Now, every living organism must interact with this environment to obtain that energy and to remove waste as well. This is an animal called a Bothrops asper, and it's eating a small frog along a stream bed in Costa Rica, representing an input of energy into that snake. Life uses energy to create order, but you just can't add energy to something and expect to get order out of it. I mean, think about a hurricane or a tornado. That's got a lot of energy, and they don't create a lot of order. Life uses metabolic reactions to use the energy to create order. So on your right, you have something like the Krebs cycle, which is used to extract energy from organic molecules we take in, and then our cells can use that energy to do um, work to basically create larger, more complex molecules. Every cell has thousands of different types of metabolic reactions. And those metabolic reactions have to have enzymes to carry out all these chemical reactions and these metabolic reactions have to be regulated. So all life has some type of heritable information that stores the information to make all the enzymes of life to direct our development and control our metabolism. So if we were to find life somewhere in the universe, it's gonna be using energy to create order through some type of chemical reactions, which are metabolic processes, and the information is gonna be stored in some type of heritable information. And for life on Earth, it is stored in DNA. DNA is a pretty remarkable molecule. It's very stable. It's made up of four different building blocks. And yet with four building blocks, it contains all the heritable information for every living thing on this planet. And it can direct and influence all the activities of our cells. Okay, for life to persist, there has to be reproduction. So, Life reproduces, and basically what's happening is during reproduction, that DNA, or the heritable information, is copied and put into the next generation. So what that means is you represent an unbroken lineage going back to the very first life on this planet. That is 3.8 billion years of an unbroken lineage. So another way of looking at that is you're the result of 3.8 billion years of evolutionary success. So, if you were to go back to your great, 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 at about a billion in the middle, grandparent, it would be some prokaryotic cell living in an ocean. On the right here, these are horseshoe crabs coming up to lay eggs. These are truly a living fossil, and the fact that we have fossils of these uh, animals going back 450 million years, and they look almost identical to the ones you see in this picture. Because life reproduces, and as part of reproduction, we copy that heritable information, we copy DNA. Well, you know well that every time you copy information, there's always errors. Whenever DNA is not copied correctly, that is a mutation. That creates variation in a population. But basically what I'm saying is because there's errors each time, it allows life to evolve. And that's what Darwin showed. We, life evolves through something called evolution by natural selection, which allows species to change over time. So this Katie did, it's a rel relative of the grasshopper there. This animal has evolved 
to look like a leaf so that it can be avoiding predators. And the more it looks like a leaf, the more likely it is to avoid a predator, the more likely it is to survive, the more likely it is to reproduce. So over time, all these favorable changes accumulate in a population. So basically, we're going to see anywhere you go in the universe or on Earth, life will evolve over time. It could be very, very rapid, or it could be actually very slow, like this horseshoe crabs. So let me come back to this question. Are you starting to understand life as a process? Would you be able to recognize something as living? On this rock on the right here, those are lichens. They are actually living organisms. They are a fungus with a symbiotic algae living in them. And because they had that relationship, they're able to live on rocks in the sunlight. It's a pretty harsh environment if you ask me. But what about alien life? If we were to find alien life on Mars or Europa, which is a moon of Jupiter, or Enceladus, a moon of Saturn, or I don't know, maybe we make a, an enormous leap in our technology and we start traveling to the stars, would we be able to recognize alien life if we saw it? Well, I would say yes. And the reason why is because we understand the process of life. We understand what life does. And if you can relate what life does here on Earth and say, hey, this is what's living, you know what? Then we can apply that to other places out in the universe. Here's something else I want you to think about. Can you relate the properties of life to thermodynamics and evolution by natural selection? So when we say life is an island of low entropy, anywhere you look in the universe, life is going to be using energy to create order through metabolic processes, and life is going to evolve over time. So that's applying it to a novel situation, finding life outside of the Earth, or to something new that we discover on this planet that might be very alien looking to us. So what's your answer now? Well, for me, it's almost always B. So how would you describe life? Hopefully, you would think of life as a process. How often have you gotten a late night conversation with somebody where they get this starry eyed look on their face and they're like, fire's alive. Really? Well, now that you've had this lecture, you could say, no, it's not. Sorry, Beavis. <laughs> fire. No, it's not alive. Yes, fire can grow. Fire can reproduce. Fire utilizes energy. But what fire does not do is create order at all. And in fact, it generates a lot more disorder. Fire is all catabolic. It's all breaking things down. It's creating entropy. Okay, so now make the connections. Do you understand the processes of life? Do you understand how thermodynamics relate to the processes of life? So if I say in class, hey, life is an island of low entropy. Do you understand what that means? And do you understand how evolution by natural selection is the central paradigm for biology.